bid you all welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to his house this evening. And may I welcome those joining us online of our own congregation uh, or visitors. Uh, welcome to Calgary Free Presbyterian Church uh, for this public worship of the one true and living God. It's good to see you in. It's good to see uh, our regulars in, one or two guests in uh, this evening. You're very welcome in the Lord's name. Before we commence the public worship of God, we have some announcements. You'll find them on the song sheet. We're reminded of the current health order where mask wearing is mandated and social distancing is required. A word of congratulations uh, to our deacon, uh, Bob Niemi, on his uh, new granddaughter. That would make it up to grandchild number five, is that right? That would be number five, wouldn't it? And, uh, and she is Juliana Linda Barron, and her middle name is named after her, her grandmother. You're reminded of our new organ fund. Uh, the organ needs replacing, and it gave us this morning an indication of how need, needed that is. Um, so you're requested if you have any, any offerings you'd like to make towards the new organ, then please put it in an envelope and mark it organ fund and put it in the box at the back, please. Men's meeting is to recommence on the first Friday of the month, and so that would be Friday 5th of February, and that'll be at 7 p.m. in the, um, in the church building. Um, you're all, all those that fall under the category men are very welcome. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, restarting the Sunday school work under the children. Uh, this coming September. If anyone is interested, then please do take that up with the Lord in prayer and come and speak to me if you're desirous to help out. Many hands make light work, and so we're really looking for a number of people to come and help out with that. Uh, prayer requests uh, for our sister Desi, an eye operation tomorrow um, during the day on a cataract. Remember Andy Ainsley, whose physical health is nowhere near as stable as it should be. Uh, we pray also for his soul and for the salvation of the family. Remember also uh, the Reverend Dr. Mark Allison and his family at the moment as he's going through a period of, of experimental treatment on the brain tumor, which has started to grow. And they think that's linked to his reduced eyesight. So remember them at this time. Remember also uh, our sister um, Beverly um, who has had treatment this last week and needs our prayers for all sorts of help and strength in other matters as well. Remember also the persecuted church, all our brethren and sisters who are being persecuted throughout the world in ways far worse than we're even experiencing here. This is a light matter in comparison. Please remember them in prayer. Confessional Corner this week is taken from the Westminster Shorter Catechism and question 18. And the question posed is, wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell? And the answer is, the sinfulness of that estate, that condition, wherein to man fell, consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want or the lack of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. So our nature and our own actions and words and deeds. Motto text for 2021 is Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, you're reminded of this Tuesday, coming Tuesday evening, 
our weekly Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, we're beginning uh, Ephesians chapter 4, the first few verses of said chapter. And you're reminded here as we look at the ministries that uh, we have the Young Adults Fellowship on the second and the fourth Friday of every month at 7 p.m. here at the church. And on the third Friday is the Ladies Fellowship uh, at 7 p.m. also. Next Lord's Day, 10 a.m. is Adult Bible Class, 11 a.m. morning worship, and 6 p.m. evening worship, preceded by half an hour of prayer. The radio programs, as broadcast, are shown here. Uh, the weekends are from this pulpit, and the weekday uh, programs are uh, looked after by our brother, Reverend Golliger from British Columbia. All these announcements and plans are absolutely subject to the will of God Almighty. Amen. Our call to worship uh, this evening is taken from Psalm 33. Psalm 33. As we are continuing and considering the foundations, which is what Genesis is really laying in all matters, foundations of the faith. Let me just give a hearty welcome to those who've just come in. It's good to see you in. So our call to worship is taken from Psalm 33 and the first nine verses. Rejoice in the Lord. O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the Lord, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breadth of his mouth, by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depths in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Amen. Please open up your song sheets to uh, number four on the song sheet. That's Psalm 89a. Psalm 89a. God's mercies I will ever sing, and with my mouth I shall by faithfulness make to be known to generations all. We'll sing all five verses, the last verse without musical accompaniment, please.
Jesus. Still our hearts and draw nigh unto God in a time of prayer, please. Let us pray. It is a privilege, O thou eternal one, to sing thy praises. It is right, it is our duty, and it is thy glory to receive praise. For thou alone hast given us life, thou hast given us breath. Every heartbeat that we have enjoyed since coming into thy house has been graciously granted by thee. We thank thee, Lord, for all thy love and thy gifts toward us. Lord, thou art good and thou art kind. And yet, Lord, if we are to be honest and examine the thoughts of our heart and the deeds of our lives, Lord, what we have sinned against thee. O oh, Lord, even the most holy of saints sins against thee. And therefore, we who know of that forgiveness, because we are the possession and the people of Christ, and Lord, we rejoice that we have that precious blood that ever cleanses us from sin. We confess, O oh Lord, that we have uh, been foolish and sinful. And we, thy people, pray, Lord, cleanse us afresh. Lord, that we may approach thee and worship thee aright. Lord, remove all that which stands in the way between us and thee, that we may have fellowship with thee, that we may know thee talking to us, even challenging us. Lord, soften our hearts and help us, we pray. We consider also in prayer those who have nothing of Christ, who have no forgiveness, who are still in their sin and under thy wrath. O oh God, whose fear is not of thee. Lord, we pray for their souls. For thee, O oh God, to come and open their hearts and their minds to give them, Lord, all that they need, that thou will put them in their right mind and heal them, causing them to call upon thee and to be saved. Lord, we pray for peace and reconciliation between the sinner and thee this evening. We bring before thee also Lord, the backslidden, we pray for thee, O Lord, to restore them fully to thee. Lord, as it is with salvation, the restoration of the backslider is that supernatural work of thy spirit. We pray for thee to work amongst us, to restore us, and have pity, Lord, upon those who are listening and watching online. Lord, remember thy people, of thy congregation here, of thy flock, who are listening and watching online. Lord, draw nigh unto them. Thou knowest that there are some who have been absent for a long time because of fears for COVID-19, of infection and other matters. Uh, thou knowest all these things. Lord, we bring them before thee and pray, Lord, that thou would strengthen and help and encourage, Lord, even heal uh, where needed. Uh, Lord, we come before thee as a people here in this land of Canada and we pray for thee, to grant, O oh God, great wisdom and much of thy fear and guidance to all in authority. Lord, thou knowest the great falling away that has taken place in this land. Lord, in the last many decades, Lord, even in the last few years, O oh Lord, if it's commanded against in thy word, if it's forbidden because it is wicked and immoral, they're passing a law to approve it. Lord, and that which has, is against thee, which is against light and life and goodness. Uh, they're passing laws, Lord, to prevent that. And so we pray unto thee, Lord, that thou would be pleased to come and to visit us. Thou hast visited us with rebuke and judgment, but we pray, O Lord, for thee to come and visit us with days and times of refreshing, of reformation and of revival, O God. Lord, thou hast left us enough to ourselves, Lord, and it is not good. Please come, Lord, revive thy people. Send awakenings to call in the elect. And Lord, send reformation to reform both the land and the church. Lord, that thy word will be preached and heard. Lord, that thou wilt send forth more laborers. Lord, convert the men of thy choosing to be preachers and teachers and missionaries. Remember also even 
uh, those ladies who would be called into the mission field. Send forth more laborers. Lord, it must be thy work and thy calling. Oh, Lord, we do pray. Truly born again people being sent forth to preach and teach the gospel. We pray, Lord, for thy blessing upon the ministries in this church. A blessing upon the pulpit ministry and on the pastoral ministry, but also upon the Young Adults Fellowship and the Ladies Fellowship, Lord, the men's Bible study, and even our desire to restart a work under the ch amongst the children of a weekly B B Sabbath school. Lord, uh, we seek for thee to lay it on people's hearts, to desire to help. Uh, Lord, it is, it is the desire to, to toil in thy kingdom is important, Lord, and we look to thee to give the ability thereafter. So, Lord, will thou help us and bless us, we pray. Remember those who are of our number who are unwell at this moment. We remember uh, our sister Desi going into that operation tomorrow. We pray for thee to grant that the operation will be a success, to take away all fear and concern from our sister, to grant uh, healing, and that all may go well with that eye operation. We pray also, our God, for our sister Bev, uh, Lord, that the, the treatment uh, that she has, undertake, has just undertaken, Lord, that all may be well. May it please thee to draw nigh unto her in those uh, various family situations that she's undergoing at the moment. Uh, Lord, strengthen her and help her and protect her. Give her much wisdom and give unto us as her church family uh, wisdom in how we may be of assistance, primarily in prayer, but also in practical matters. Lord, draw nigh, we pray. Remember the Reverend Dr. Mark Allison. Uh, Lord, we thank thee that there have been three completed treatments. They are heavy. They are difficult. Please, we pray, uh, grant that they may be successful, that the tumor will uh, decrease in size. Grant also that his eyesight may improve. Uh, Lord, and comfort him. Lord, comfort his wife. Comfort his daughter. Lord, and his brother-in-law. Bless the whole family. Remember the Wagner family also. Even at this time, I draw nigh unto Mrs. Wagner. And we pray also for healing and for help. Remember our sister congregation in Orlando, desirous to bring the Reverend Thomas Laverty over, having called him many months ago. And Lord, would thou be pleased to open the doors of that visa, the green card and entrance into Florida. And Lord, it has been much delayed. It's not out of thy hand. Thou art sovereign in all these and every matter. But we pray, Lord, remember thy folk there in Orlando and thy servant, Mr. Laverty. Lord, we cast all these concerns and these burdens before thee. We remind thee once again of all our loved ones for whom we regularly pray. Lord, wilt thou have mercy upon their souls? Wilt thou save them? Thou must save, and thou alone. For us... <clears throat> for the sinner, for the relatives of the sinner, it is impossible, but for thee nothing is impossible. So hear our prayer, <coughs> we pray thee, in Jesus' name, amen. Please open your song sheets up to hymn number, uh, number five on the song sheet. <coughs> which is hymn 72 in our songbook. That is, glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. God Almighty, three in one. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to him alone. And we'll stand to sing these four verses, please.
Please open your copies of God's holy, infallible, and absolutely trustworthy word to Genesis and chapter 1. The first book of Moses, Genesis chapter 1. As the Lord is pleased to help us, we're examining in detail, some detail, anyway, the third day of creation, but we will read together uh, the whole of the creation account once again, uh, by repetition, trusting that the Lord's word will enter in more and more. And may the Lord grant you faith and clear hearing to hear and believe his word. Genesis chapter 1, commencing our reading at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them and said, be, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth 
after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and are over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the earth, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And may the Lord be pleased to bless the public reading of his precious word to our every heart. Amen. I ask um, uh, Mr. Dirk Struck to come and to give a word of thanks for our offerings, please. Father, it says here in the song, or that we sung, God's mercies I will ever sing, and with my mouth I shall thy faithfulness make to be known to the generations all. Father, we are ever so thankful, O Lord, that thou hast had mercy upon us, O Lord, and thou hast revealed thy Son to us, Father. Lord, thou hast blessed us, O Lord, Father, with health and strength. We ask and pray, Father, would thou so be pleased, O Lord, to Lord, take our offerings, Father, that we give unto thee, O Lord, this portion, O Lord, and make use of it, Lord, for the extension of thy kingdom, Father. Lord, would thou be pleased, O Lord, to give Mr. Bacchus, O Lord, sheep for hire, and those that are faithful unto thee, O Lord, may it please you, Lord, to save their souls. Even today and throughout this world, Lord, we do ask and pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Our offering uh, song is hymn 61, which is at the back of the hymn sheet, number six on the hymn sheet, hymn 61, this is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres, this is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought, we'll stand to sing these three verses, please.
So may I ask you once again to open your copies of God's infallible word to Genesis chapter 1. As I already mentioned, uh, we hope to examine the third day of the six days of creation. You'll take us to verses 9 to 13. And we read those verses once again together. Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Amen. Uh, let us seek from the Lord the much needed help, illumination, understanding, blessing that we can only receive from him. So let us approach him together, please. O Lord God, the one true and living God, the one creator, thou who art eternally enthroned, thou rulest all things with fairness, with goodness, with justice. It is to thee that we come this evening and give thee thanks for thy word that we have read. We thank thee for the times that we have sung thy praise. We thank thee for the time of prayer we thank thee for all that thou hast granted us, that we, out of the riches and the, the abundance of thy giving to us, that we may give a portion back. We thank thee, Lord, for all of these aspects of thy worship. And it is our prayer, Lord, as we come to this time of the preaching of thy word, that we may know thee and know thy blessing and know thine illumination at this high point of worship, Lord, that we may pray that prayer, that petition at the end of Psalm 19, that the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. And it is our prayer, Lord, that our worship and our lives will be acceptable in thy sight. And so, Lord, open our hearts this evening. Bring thy word and feed thy people. And Lord, bring thy word and convert those unto thy people. Even tonight, thy word is a word of power. It converts the sinner, converts the man, woman, boy, and girl that lies in sin. And thy word, O Lord, is a sanctifying word. It changes thy people from being in the likeness of the first fallen Adam into the likeness of the second and glorious Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us, we pray. We need thy blessing upon our minds and hearts. We need thee to humble us before the word of God, to give us illumination in our minds that we may understand, that we may believe, we pray, for thy spirit to be poured upon us. We thank thee, Lord Jesus, that thou art here. And so help us, we pray, in this act of worship. And give unto me all that I need. And Lord Jesus, thou knowest that I need much to preach thy word aright. Give me of thy spirit, give me of thy unction and of thy blessing, Lord, to feed the flock, to declare Christ and him crucified, uh, to preach truly from this word, thy word, to bring glory to thee, that thou, O eternal Son of God, will bring glory to the Father and to the triune Godhead. Hear as we pray, thou mighty and merciful one. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his everlasting glory. Amen. And so here we are considering together with the Lord's help creation, the account, the true historical account and scientifically accurate, though not detailed, account of creation. Written uh, very probably by the hand of Moses. I have no doubt, I have no reason to doubt that truth. That Moses there in 1450s, having received from the Lord much by word of mouth. As a friend speak to a friend, so the Lord spoke to Moses and revealing much in these first five books of Moses. But here we have an eyewitness, not Moses, but the Lord Jehovah himself knows exactly what he said, when he said it, how he said it, as he brings the whole of time, matter, space, the whole of the earth, the whole of everything into being. And how? By the word of his mouth, by the word of his power, as Hebrews 1 and verse 3 would speak it. And we've already looked and examined uh, many aspects of the fact that it is the triune God who's at work. We've considered the, the very first moment of creation when there is a, there's an earth, there's a, a physical earth and a spiritual heaven made. And then we've looked in the, in the, in the proceeding uh, couple of days what the Lord has done. And then seeing the Lord last time creating the firmament, the two firmaments, so the one firmament of heaven and just below that, the open firmament, which is not revealed until we get to day five. The naming thereof, I mean. But we now come to verses nine to 13, the third day of creation. And Matthew Henry, when he considered uh, this third day of creation, he writes this. He says, hitherto, up till now, the power of the creator had been exerted and employed about the upper part of the visible world. The light of heaven was kindled, and the firmament of heaven was fixed. But now he descends to this lower world, the earth, which was designed for the children of men, designed both for their habitation and for their maintenance. Now that may even hint to us and give us something of doctrine and, and teaching to understand that heavenly matters are more important than earthly matters in all things. If we have the heavenly right, then the earthly is correct. If we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, then we will be enabled to love our neighbor. But what we have also understood as we've gone through these, these two days so far and coming to this third day of creation, is that if that firmament had not been created, then the body of water that was on the world would have prevented any air, any atmosphere, any separating of the land and sea. So these are logical steps as well. Our God is a God of order, a God of logic, a, a God of care. This is the, I've, there's no chaos mentioned here. Even some people will look at verse 2 and think the earth was out form and void. What chaos? No. The land had not had forming and geography put upon it. It was not filled. That's all it means. No terraforming and no filling had taken place. There's no chaos. Not in the negative sense of the word. There's not yet full order and full creation. I have examined it as looking at it from chaos to cosmos. But that's not in the negative sense of the word at all. And so the Lord's moving along. Carefully. And he has chosen to do it in six 24-hour days. His choice. Could have done it in a, in a millisecond. But he just spoken the worlds into existence in one go. But it pleased him for our good and for our teaching and for our knowledge to work his way through these days. And it is on this third day of creation, having used that, that, that fancy word, terraforming, that we see that act taking place. The Lord is coming to the earth. The earth he can now come to and he can turn a formless and empty world into one that has form. And he can commence filling it. 
And this 24-hour creation day, this third day of creation, as we've read together, it has two major acts to take place. First is the separation of land and sea. That must take place. And secondly, the seeding of the land. The seeding of the land. Those two separate acts are to be done, and it's, it's really not too unreasonable to consider, well, the first act of separating land and water, that might be the first 12 hours, and the seeding of the, of the land into another 12 hours. But whatever the exact timing is, and the exact details and the methods that God used, uh, we shall, with the Lord's help, examine what we have in the Scriptures, and that is the genesis of land and sea. The genesis of land and sea. And when we examine these verses 9 to 13, and we look at verse 9, we see firstly that there is a, the gathering. The gathering. In verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And that's what we see here. Uh, the gathering, the forming of the sea is firstly what we see, the forming of the sea. I know the exact method whereby God formed the sea is not mentioned. It's not mentioned here. What we see is that the Lord commands it and it happens, and the exact method he, he, he used to bring the land upwards is not mentioned, and we can consider things. We were thinking about this the other night in family worship with the family. C could that be something to do with magma and volcanic activity? It might be. But we get a hint in Psalm 104, 100, Psalm 104, verses 6 to 9, uh, speak of, well, speak thus, I will just read out Psalm 104, verses 6 to 9. Uh, speaking of the earth, thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over that they turn not again to cover the earth. Now, is that speaking of creation? Or is that speaking of the settling of matters after Noah's flood? It could be both. The context, I would suggest, it seems to point more to creation. But what it does seem to point to in any case is that there is a rising up of gr ground and that there is a, a, um, a descending of ground. So land is going up and land is going down. And of course, when land goes down, then there's more space for the water. When the land goes up, well, the water will run off it. Uh, could that give us a hint of what we understand these days as what they call plate tectonics? We have the, the earth is on various plates and then one plate goes beneath one and lifts up the other. That's how certain things are formed in the, in the earth and the movement of things. Or is that only happened after the flood? We don't know we weren't there before the flood or what happened. But in any case, here's the most important thing, is that the land rose up out of the earth. It rose up and the waters ran off it. And they all ran off it into one place, as it says. Let the waters under the heaven, under the sky that is, be gathered together unto one place. And what is that one place? Well, the, the lower regions of the earth the parts of the earth which are lower down than the other parts where the water would find its own level. Then we have the naming of the seas. That great gathering of water he calls seas. Literally seas as it's written here. And so he doesn't just call it sea, he calls it seas. He doesn't call it water, but seas. And as we know, or you may know, uh, the world is filled with seas. We have the Pacific Ocean, we have the, uh, the Indian Ocean, there's the Atlantic Ocean, there's the Mediterranean Sea, and yet when it comes down to it, it's all one large body of water. It's all been gathered together in one place, and doubtless the earth has, has changed it, its appearance, the, the amount of earth that's hit there. Of course, there's been a worldwide flood since uh, this um, uh, genesis of land and sea, and so sea levels have no doubt have, have changed much, and yet the sea still only has one place. That, that, that truth has not changed at all. Of course, this does not mean that there's no water left on the land, because as water is running off, it will quite naturally, it will quite naturally um, cut rivers and channels and, and canyons into that soft ground as it's coming off, and 
It's very possible that there is land, there is seas that have been trapped as inland lakes and inland seas, and that's exactly what we see with the world still, although I'm, I would not suggest that the world that we see today is the exact same shape and form of continents as was then. But the principle and the truth is absolutely uh, the same. And of course, we also know that there is underground water, underground rivers. Uh, the Bible speaks of that, and it's only recently that, fairly recently, the science has actually f discovered that as well, that there are undergree, undersea, well, we knew there were underground rivers and streams, but that there are underground lakes and even seas. And we know, therefore, that there are fountains that spring up. There are fountains that spring up even today, the water that's under pressure. And we know that when the Lord plants the Garden of Eden, that there is a great fountain that's, that springs out there. There's a head of a river of four rivers, forms four rivers. And so we see then that the, that the relationship between the earth and the sea, between the land and the water, is now being made very clear before this time uh, the land had been under the water. Had it been mixed with the water? Was it sort of like a, a muddy mix and then came out? Well, it couldn't be completely because, of course, the land is not just soil. It's not just sand. It's also rock. In fact, that's really the basis of land is, is, is the rock and then it's covered uh, with fertile earth. And so we've seen then the, the, the forming of the sea and, and, and the naming of the sea, but we see also, and we understand this, the blessing of the sea that the Lord has made all this to be a great blessing to us and to mankind. Without the, any, without the seas, without water, well, there would be no life. There would be no life at all. There would be no rain. There's not rain yet, but there would be rain. Rain and irrigation. There would be no rivers, and therefore there would be no drink, no drinking water. And without the sea, and I'm looking further ahead now to the fifth day, There'd be no fish, be no shellfish, no seaweed, no oysters, no mother of pearl. And without the sea, there'd be no dry land. If the water hadn't run off the land, there, there wouldn't be any land. So there's a relationship still there. And we wouldn't have the land itself and everything that we're able to do with the land. Also, and this is something I found in my research, without the sea, there'd be no temperature regulation on the planet. There would be no buffer uh, to absorb uh, extra heat or to give off warmth when it's too cold. We, we too quickly uh, uh, turn into an ice ball or into a, a dried uh, ball of heat so quickly, despite the fact of the precise placement uh, that the Lord has put the sun in relation to the earth. And of course, without the sea, and maybe that's less applicable here in Alberta, there'd be no seaside, there'd be no place for recreation and swimming. But there's also dangers of the sea. The dangers of the sea, although they're not really applicable in Genesis 1, where there is no death and there is no danger. But the sea is able to flood the land. It's able to, all able to cause much damage and destruction. Well, we know there are floods here. Floods have taken place in Alberta, so I don't have an idea anyway. The destruction that water can do to land, that it can do to farmland, that it can do to houses. But God doesn't just cause this sea to be without any control. In fact, we read some of that in that psalm. Uh, the Lord uh, limits it. He doesn't, it gives, the Lord gives water certain properties, and he gives it amazing properties. But he keeps it in its place. The Lord keeps it in its place. And so normally speaking, so not when there's a judgment of God upon the earth, or on this portion of the earth, or on a portion of Alberta, not the time of Noah. These are exceptional times of judgment, but normally. And the Lord has expressed this in poetical terms, that he has limited the control and the, the rebellion, shall we say, of water over the land. And he says in Job 38, 11, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy, thy proud waves be stayed. And so we, we have this, this water. This can be so dangerous, and there are many people who have, since the fall, have succumbed to the dangers of drowning and the like. But that is not here. That is not even in the, that is not as it were in the, in the creation intention of God, although of course that is all in the eternal decree of God. 
but he gathers all the waters into one place. And that's really what we're seeing here. And, and this continues from the previous two days that the Lord is a separating and a dividing God. He separates and he divides. He separates truth from falsehood. He separates false religion from true gospel religion. He separates the just from the unjust. And we considered um, last time the very truth that there will be a great division. There will be a division heavenwards and there will be a division downwards. And the Lord will draw to himself those who are his. And as God gathered the waters together in one place, he also gathers his people together. And we will all be gathered together in one place. We're gathered together in one place this evening. But ultimately, we will be gathered together. Those who are gathered together already in Christ will be gathered together to be with Christ. And so there is a great gathering coming to those who have received this from God, that they would hear the gospel, they would hear the good news, they would hear the claim and the call of the gospel to repent and believe and obey it. And so be gathered together with God, with Jesus, in a place of bliss, a place of eternal happiness that we could call heaven or we could call heaven on earth, which is what we were just singing just now. That is the gathering. There's a spiritual application for all of this. And after the gathering we see, or at the same time as the gathering, we see the appearing. Because as the, as the waters are gathered together, there is the appearing of the land. And now we see that in verse 10. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he sees, and God saw that it was good. And so we've already mentioned the very idea that as the land is coming up, the water is running off. It's running off into the seas. It's forming the seas in this dry land. It appears, and, and, and it, it, it appears with a surface that can do what? That can be planted. A surface that can then bring forth new life and abundant life. And this is what the Lord is doing. Everything has a purpose. And so the separating of the water is not just to prove that the Lord can, can separate billions of gallons of water uh, from many square uh, miles of land, uh, but that he's doing it for a purpose. He's doing it for us. He's doing it for us. Ultimately, he's doing it for Christ and for Christ's people. But he reveals a surface upon which plants can be grown, and it's got to be a fairly solid surface that's not going to uh, give up the plants immediately. It can't be a muddy mass by any means, but we'll look at that a little bit later when we examine what the Lord is doing with all of this uh, green plants. How long did it take for the waters to run off? How long would it take for the whole earth to run off? If you consider the time of Noah, how many months it took after the rain ceased and the fountains of the deep had, had stopped their, 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 their filling of the earth with water? Well, it took many months. But this is not the same situation, of course. Here there, we don't have an over... A, a, a literally too much water that then has to be taken into however it was taken in. But here we have a land that's raised up, the water runs off. But it could take a lot longer than the few hours it does seem to take here. And why am I uh, making this point? I'm trying to point out that, that this would appear as if the whole of the week of creation is supernaturally energized, is supernaturally worked. We can't just rely upon the laws of physics and nature as we see them now. Because this is a creation week and the Lord must do everything within a week. So if he's waiting for the water to run off, it could be a, a creation year. And yet the Lord has determined otherwise. That water must be cleared off the land. That land must be plantable. It must be ready for his farming work within 12 hours. To do that work, to set that work afoot. And besides which, the word that's used, and God called the dry earth he called the dry land we've added the word land in it literally just says dry in the earth and that particular one word of hebrew i know there's a couple of hebrew scholars in i could embarrass them and ask them if they remember the word but i won't but this particular one word we, we come across again in the scriptures it it, it, do, it literally means dry ground it's the word that's used when the when the israelites go across the red sea the lord sent a wind the whole night it opened up the the, the waters to a wide extent, and then they walked across 
on dry land. And so there weren't mud pools, there was no sinking sand, there was no water baths to have them to step over. It was called dry, and it was called dry because it was dry. Dry land. And, and that happened as a miracle. And if you know Joshua chapter 3, where the, the people of God enter over the river Jordan to take in uh, the promised land, and what happens there? Well, the, the, the waters are, are in a place called Adam, uh, very far up the river Jordan. That's where the waters are, are gathered together and held back by the Lord. And then the waters flow down very quickly. But it's not just the waters that we see with the hand, but it's even the water in the sand that flows away. Because within a few minutes, they're stepping onto dry land. And that's the idea that we have here. It's dry. It's become dry. It's become supernaturally and quickly dry so the Lord can continue building our home. Building our home. Walking on dry land. And as the Lord delivers the land from its watery graves, the watery grave that it was in, just a modern term, there's nothing grave and nothing morally bad about these waters. But as the Lord delivers the land from that watery depth, the Lord also delivers sinners from the depths of our own sin. There is a depth. You consider there's a water level that you could take. There's a water level that you might be to. Maybe, maybe you can swim in 10 foot of water and you can tread water and you can stay there. But what if there's no land? What if there's just a, a breadth of water that you cannot go from one place to another? There's no place to put your foot. You're sinking deep in sin, as the gospel chorus says. We were sinking deep in sin, looking to rise no more. And that is the spiritual truth of every sinner, is that we are in a depth of sin, and it's far more than 10 feet. Hundreds of feet of water behind, below us, hundreds of feet of water to the left and to the front and to the back, and there we are, not even treading water, but sinking, going downwards. And in the same way that we were deep, sinking in sin, in a deep sea of our own making. And it's not only that we're, to use the imagery of the water, which we're in, we're sinking in our own sin, but that sin is also a sticky and a wet and a slimy clay holding us fast, stopping us from trying to swim away. Maybe even stopping us, we think, trying to swim to safety in the arms of Jesus himself. Psalm 40 and verse 2 is a, has that great image, and if you don't know the location, you'll know these words. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. This is the wonderful gospel news that there is. Although we are in the deepest of sinful seas, sins of our own making, and of our own making, and, and to be of our own destruction, and of our own judgment, and yet the Lord has given us the rock, Christ Jesus, to put our feet upon him, to give hope. So there we are. We've got nowhere to put our feet, and yet the Lord raises up a rock. He raises up the Lord. He raises up the gospel. He raises up your soul from death. He can pluck us out. His arm is never too short. No matter how deep your sea of sin is, the Lord can separate you from it and deliver you without doubt. And he separates us. He can and he does. He separates us. If I was to ask people, many in this room could put their hand up. He's, he, he delivered me from those deep waters of my sin. He separated me from those waters, separated me from his wrath, separated me from the woe of my own making. So that's the dryness of uh, this land that appears. But there's also a declaration given because when that dry land comes up and the water rushes off and that land is ready for the next wonderful creative act, to build our home, and the seeds are in their place. We have that declaration, and God says, and God saw that it was good. It was good. It's good that we had a home. It's good that we had a home. 
As we see shortly, it's good that the fish will have a home. But why does the Lord declare it to be good? Well, the division of sea and land was now completed. That act, that step in creation was completed. And when it was completed, and it was completed according to the word of God, therefore God declared it good. That God had declared what was to happen, and God made it happen. And God declared that it was good, what God had declared and God had made. As, as God performs his very word, and things are performed according to his word, the word the Lord declares it to be good. It was exactly according to the standard that he had determined. Notice, you might have noticed last week, he did not declare the firmament to be good. You may have finished the second day. Let me have a quick look now. At the end of the second day, verse uh, five, uh, 7. So we just see that, that the firmament is made, and it was so, but the Lord does not declare it good. Is, is that because he wasn't happy with the firmament? Oh, yes, he is, but the firmament is not complete. The firmament is still expanding, and it's still empty. And it is until the fourth day that the Lord fills it with the sun and the moon and the stars. He fills that firmament, and then what does he declare? He declares it was good. He saw that it was good. So it's not finished yet. So it's not that one thing is good in creation, and the other thing's not so good. It just has not completed that act of creation. Which teaches us also a lesson. That if you and I, Christian, desire to have the well done of God, and we do. I've never spoken to a Christian, a truly born again Christian who's not backslidden, walking with the Lord. Do you want to have the well done of God? Do you want God to be pleased with you? Do you want to, the Lord to look at you and even though we know that we're worthless servants, that he might still call us good and faithful? Well, let us do this. Let us learn to live according to his every word. And then it's guaranteed. The Lord will see it and say, it is good because we're living according to his word. That's not to bribe him. This is not to have an exterior where the interior is not good. No, absolutely everything. That we've come to the Lord, that we've repented of our sins, that we are born again, that we are walking with the Lord and we are confessing our sins before him. We're doing all that the Lord uh, requires of us to please him. Not to bribe him, but to please him. Why? Because we love him. Because he has put love in our hearts towards him. And so let us live absolutely according to what the word of God. Let us be, as the early Christians were called, the people of the book. Let us be so. That's like the, the, like the Bereans. Now they were people of the book, and they, they, even, they heard the apostle Paul. They went straight to the scriptures just to check if it was so. The gathering, the appearing, and then we have thirdly, the greening. The greening in verse 11. So having prepared the ground and the seas, the Lord now comes to do a, a beautifying work. But it's not just beauty. It's not, this is not just a layer of makeup, although it's gorgeous. This is many things, and we'll look at them a little bit more in detail as we look at verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself, it's in the fruit, upon the earth, and it was so. So we're coming back to the ground now. That ground, the ground that the Lord had prepared, it, 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 must, be, it must be dry enough to hold a tree, but it must be wet enough uh, to water a plant. And so God has that absolutely down perfect. We haven't got masses, morasses of, uh, of, 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 of mud pits all over the earth. And then the Lord seeds all those areas and then the seeds, they, 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 they rot or they, they're too dormant and they won't grow for a long time yet. Every part of the earth, according to the word the Lord would like it, whether it's a, let's just say they had tropical regions and temperate regions in those days, probably they didn't, but whatever it was, it was probably all tropical. But whatever different areas, whether it's more rocky or it's more, has more soil or acidic, the Lord has removed exact amount of water to then do this work. Perfection is in the hand of our God. And so that, that land is perfect for whatever the Lord uh, is, is busy uh, doing. But notice now what the Lord says. Let's be careful that we see what the Lord says, whom the Lord speaks to. In verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. He commands the ground. 
Well, that shows us what the plants and the trees and the bushes are made from. They're made from the same atoms, the same molecules that the earth is made from. And that's a scientific fact. The, but the land itself is, is commanded to bring forth this, this new growth, and it obeys. Obeys. See how obedient creation is to God. And then we look at mankind. But the ground, and then we have the growth, and that's verse 12. The, the Lord has said it, and then the ground obeys. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So we have three, three sorts of plant life are mentioned here. Three broad categories of plant life that the Lord would give to the earth. They're, they're, not, they're not modern scientific kingdom classifications uh, of whatever under the kingdom is, the plant kingdom. It's not meant to be this classification that was invented in Europe 200 years ago. This is something that people of all time can understand. The language is, as I've mentioned before, and I'll mention it again, the language is here, is that all sorts of people can understand this, whether they're educated, whether they're modern, whether they're not so modern, that they would understand, what's he talking about? Do I understand what a plant is? Yes. Do I understand what a grass is? Yes. But we should understand this, is all sorts, in fact, all of plant life is created by God, whether it's big or it's small. If it's small as a blade of grass, whether it's as large as a bush, or whether it's as large as a tree, the Lord has made them all in great diversity, in great different sizes. The grass kind, the plant kind, the tree kind, and everything in between kind. And we could compare that to the idea of species, but it wouldn't be exactly the same. It's really sort of like the, the tree kind, and maybe we'll have the evergreen tree kind and the deciduous tree kind, but the idea of that is that there would be uh, a sort of tree that would produce many more other trees as, as humans themselves. We all come from Adam and Eve, and yet we're tall and we're short and we have different colored skins and different, different colored hair and different amount of hair or whatever else we might have that differs us one from another. We're all from that original pair, and the same with these grasses and plants and bushes and trees created on this day. But notice how fruitful everything is. It's fruitful. I mean, that's the, that's what the Lord's talking. He's saying he's making a plant, and it's fruitful. It's going to go forth. It's going gonna, it's gonna to produce more of itself exactly according to its kind and produce a lot more. It's fruitful. And although it's not mentioned, grass is also fruitful. Fra grass also produces seeds. In fact, a sort of grass is called wheat and barley. They're also grass sorts. And the speed of this growth, what would that speed be? Because again, if the Lord is just planting this ground and just leaving it to grow in its normal pace, well, the earth would not be green very quickly. It would take a long time. It would actually take many months. Just grass, if you plant grass seed, it would take a good six, seven, eight weeks to get a decent height, and it would take a lot longer to get a decent thickness. Never mind all the rest of the plants, and of course trees will take a lot longer. But the Lord, as is with all things, He's creating a mature earth. He created a mature earth, and he, he's, he's expanding the firmament, and it's not a, a firmament that, makes, that needs two billion years to, to mature. It's ready for use in two days once it's expanded large enough. Same with the land and the, and, and, and the sea. He's making something that is, that is solid now, that's ready to work, that's, that's the foundation of the earth and the land that we're on. The rock is there, it's solid, it's made. And it may look as though it's three billion years old, but it's two days old. But there must be a supernatural element to this growth. There has to be, because within, within two days... There are birds that need the food. Within three days, there are animals that will need the food. I mean, this is just separate from the Garden of Eden that God will actually plant himself. But they will need to because he has said to the animals, be fruitful and multiply. And no doubt they are beginning to multiply very quickly and to fill the earth. And so they would depart from the Garden of Eden. The Lord knows that within a few days, that Adam and Eve, or well, in a short time, whatever that might be, but I think within a few days that Adam and Eve would be expelled from the Garden of Eden. They would need a place to grow where there were fruit trees that bore fruit. 
And so there would be a supernatural growth as the Lord commands the earth to bring forth. It would be shooting up. And then there is gain as well because there is much to be gained from what the Lord is doing here for us. I mean, it's blessing after blessing after blessing when we consider what the Lord is, is doing. But especially now we come to this latter part of the third day, we see the Lord's gracious and blessed hand in the greening of the planet. Because he's making plants and, and fruit that are food, that are food for us and food for our food. It's vital that we have food. There's very few of us that go a day without food. We're quite addicted to food. We like it regularly. And we need it to sustain us. And then we have that grass that is laid down as a carpet beneath our feet. Yes, it softens our tread, but it also, it colors our world. When we have beautiful green grass, it looks delightful to the eye. And the wood and the leaves, well, a very simple shelter could be made from those. But what the Lord has given to man, what we can do with wood these days, that the houses that can be built, the, 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 the bridges that can be formed, or whatever else that we can do, even from that, and then of all the plants, what the Lord has built into the plant. It's the Lord that puts all these properties into things. Nothing has developed on its own. The Lord has put those properties in there. And so we have all these little plants, and some of them taste nice, some of them are herbs, but some of them are quite stringy and strandy, and then we find out we can make fibers out of them. Think of flax and think of cotton and the like. And so the Lord has made uh, this earth a uh, 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 a rich and special earth, and now he's greening it. And we looked last time when the Lord made the firmament, and if the firmament is made out of the water, as would seem very logical, and water is hydrogen and oxygen, the firmament's made out of hydrogen, and then there's an oxygen-rich atmosphere. So we've got an oxygen-rich atmosphere, we have a nitrogen-rich ground, and the Lord says to the earth, bring forth plants. What a lush world would be in existence in, in, great, in great speed. So having seen those that those aspects of the, of the, the ordering of the, the third day, the gathering of the waters, the appearing of the lands, and the greening of the earth, uh, we come finally to the preparing. The preparing. Because there is a preparation here for further creation, and we've, we've hinted at it already a few times. Well, he has to be ready for the next day. So he has to get day three finished and get the plants in the ground. Uh, he's got to be ready for the next day. Or the plants are ready and waiting for the next day, because the next day the sun, the sun is there. So although they're, although they're shooting up without the sun, and yet they only have to wait one day, excuse me, before the plants can make their own food from the sunlight and grow even further. Uh, they need that sun, and they will receive that sun. How the Lord has prepared things, and sometimes in life we have to wait for what the Lord has already prepared to do, but when the time is right, when the Lord's time is right, it will be given. And so these plants... They must, they have no idea how long they have to wait. They have no understanding, but the Lord has it all ready and set out for those plants. Unable to think, unable to feel, unable to plan and think ahead, but the Lord is even thinking of them as he thinks on us. As the Lord has from the very beginning, even from before the beginning, prepared all things, uh, even for our good, for our spiritual benefit. We who were... Uh, dead in trespasses and sins. I mean, our spiritual life was, not, was, was actually far worse than a blade of grass. A blade of grass has life, but we spiritually were dead. And yet it pleased the Lord to prepare ahead, to prepare a savior, to prepare all that we needed, that in due time, he would make us call upon him for salvation. But we're still looking at the creation week at the moment, ready for the fifth day also, Right, that there was a sea for the fish to go and swim in and ready for the sixth day. That there is a land ready for the Garden of Eden to be planted in. But there's also here not only a preparation for the further creation, but there is a preparation for recreation. For recreation, the act of recreation that the Lord does. This third day that we see here, is a preparation for the ultimate third day, the third day that will take place. But the fact that there's dry ground, the Lord in a few chapters' time can even preach the simplest of gospels to Adam. That there is dry ground, that there is a tree, that there is a tree of life, that there is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yes, the Lord will plant them and we'll see them. He plants them separately in day two, in chapter two of Genesis. 
and yet the very idea of tree and the, the idea of ground, it's all there, it's all prepared. And then the Lord says to fallen Adam, and now we're closer to home, as soon as we now we're getting to the fall. But now at the fall, Adam has fallen, we've fallen in Adam. And then God says in Genesis 3 and verse 15, having said, uh, Gen he said, having said, Adam, where art thou? He says in Genesis 3 and 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That may seem a little obscure, but it's pointing to the work of Christ on the cross. It's the Lord dividing the devil's seed uh, from godly seed. Uh, there's so many things in there, but I'm just trying to say that there is even the earth and the ground that's here just those few days later, the first gospel word can now be spoken because the land has been separated from the waters. But also at this time, rocks are formed. Rocks are formed in, in the creation. The rocks come out of the water and the rocks make up mountains and hills and, and become parts of cities and become the rock of Golgotha itself all prepared for, all placed purposely and perfectly by God. Trees were created, we've already considered that. And there many, many descendants produced wood for one tree, for the tree of the cross of Calvary. These things here are pointing to that 4,000 years hence, or thence I should say, And again, some of those rocks that the Lord formed in that first day and brought out of the water would be the rock out of which the tomb was made for the Lord Christ's body. And even the plants that we considered, the mare, the incense, the aloes that were used for the embalming of that dead body. Ready for the ultimate third day. But on the third day, of course, is not the day of his death. It's the day of his resurrection. It's the bringing of new life out of death. And that's what we also understood as Christ came out of the depths of death unto life. Like the land, it was brought out of a watery grave into the life of the fresh air. In the same way, the sinner that calls upon Jesus Christ knows that breath of spiritual air knows the relief of sins forgiven, knows that everything that was was of him and was accusing him and was against him is now behind him. Because he called upon the Savior and the Savior heard him. The Savior answered and the Savior drew him out of that spiritual death unto life. And the risen Christ does that still. He draws many souls to this new life even now this same Savior who spoke these, this world into existence and spoke to the ground and said, let it bring forth life, can even speak to your soul this evening and say that you can have new life. And he's doing so through the preaching of his word, that there is a new life. And therefore, there is also that promise of a new heaven and a new earth for everyone that puts their trust in him. Andrew Fuller, an old preacher, said this, See how careful our Heavenly Father was to build us a habitation before he gave us a being. And nor is this the only instance of the kind. Our Redeemer has acted on the same principle in going before us to prepare a place for us. Everything. Everything is prepared. And this is the whole idea of this day. It's a day of preparation for that which is to come in the remainder of the week, but also that which is yet to come as far as the gospel's concerned. And even today, that this part of the land, this part of the earth came up out of the water, was exposed to the, to the elements for how many thousands of years that today, or 40 years ago, or how many years ago it was, roughly 40 years ago, that this building itself was built. We only had it for less than that, 25 or so years but that this building would be built from wood, wood frame, from trees, from other things, that all things that the Lord has made and that the Lord has had this evening also on his heart and in preparation. As every single atom of water that he determined would run off, ran off, 
and every atom, or should say molecule, every molecule of water that stayed on the earth in those inland lakes remained where he said it would be. Uh, so you are all here this evening because the Lord has determined it. Even for you to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as the Lord has spoken all things into existence by the word of his power, new life can be granted to you just by the word of Christ, even this evening. But it is his work, and it is his power, and it is his privilege, but it is his calling. And so the question is to you who are in the meeting this evening, those who are listening online, are you still sinking and dying under a load of guilt and sin? Are you smothered by the waters of, of death and impending death? Then you must do this. You must call upon the name of God. The one God who can raise you up out of that water. Because those waters of sin will soon turn into the fires of hell. And that is a promise that the Lord will always keep. But before we get that far, we have the promise of the gospel that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so while the Lord is here tonight with the word of life and the words of life, and as he's calling you to come to him and to repent and to believe and to have that new life, now is not the day of judgment. Now is not a day where there is no grace. Today is a day of grace, of, of undeserved kindness shown to you in the fact that the Lord has prepared you to be here this evening. But God must create that new life in you. The Lord Jesus Christ had a visitor one night. It was one of those highly religious and self-righteous people called the Pharisees. And he came at night because he didn't want his Pharisee friends to see him. So he comes to Jesus at night and, and he comes and he's, he's curious to know who Jesus is, because nobody can do the miracles or speak the words like he does and not be sent from God. And Jesus just ignores his curious theological question, and then he points to him to a fact that is a personal fact. He is this man who is highly religious. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And there, this man thought he was a teacher about the kingdom of God. And yet the Lord Jesus knew better. You're spiritually blind and you're spiritually dead and you must be born again. There must be that rebirth. There must be a spiritual breaking of the waters to release the sinner from death and to bring him into new life with God. Else the sin still stains and condemns. And Christ, having spoken of the necessity of the rebirth, he then goes on a few verses later in John chapter 3 to say this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, not hope for, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that is what I may say to you tonight. You're still alive. You're still in a day of grace. The Lord has spoken words of his gospel to you this evening through the preaching and through the reading of the word. He has come not to condemn you, but to save you. If you would but call upon him. So don't perish in the waters of your unbelief and of your sin, but believe on Christ and be saved. You know what Christ did to Noah and his family? He saved them from the floods. Let Christ save you from the floods of God's wrath and from the floods of your sin. You must call upon him. He says it, call upon him. He doesn't say be as passive as a dead doorpost. He says that you must call upon him. And let's not not call upon him because we've hyper-spiritualized our reaction to the gospel. But I can't save me. No, you can't, but you go to him who can. Now let us seek the Lord, even to that effect, this evening. Let us pray.
O oh Lord, we give thee thanks and praise that thou art our creator and a wonderful creator art thou, Lord. And what we've seen already as we come to the third day as foundation after foundation after foundation has been laid to make a home for thy people. O oh Lord, and ultimately to make a place where Jesus could walk on the earth and preach the gospel and hang on that tree, hang on that wood as an, acc as an accursed criminal for the sins of his own people. We've considered also, Lord, uh, the deep waters. And from the deep waters, by the word of thy command, that thou'dst bring the earth, the land, up. That it, 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 as it were, could breathe. But what it could do is also receive new life and plant life. And we've thought, Lord, of all those spiritual lessons and the gospel lessons that we can draw out of that. And Lord, we do pray as those gospel warnings and promises have gone forth that thy Holy Spirit, the third person of the, of the triune Godhead, very God himself, that thou Spirit of God will go forth and will, will enter into hearts, will cause minds to be thinking, will be convicting them of their sin, of showing something in the convicted conscience, something of the judgment of God against them, and that, Lord, that thou will draw them to call upon thee and be saved. Lord, thou art no man that thou shouldst lie. And when thy promises in the gospel are declared, Lord, they are true, every one. But it is thy work to cause the sinner to call upon thee. And yet it is the duty of every sinner to call upon thee. And so, Lord, we pray, soften and change the wills of those who are against thee, that they may be for thee. And bless the going forth of thy word to those also who are listening and watching online. Lord, thou hast granted the church a great commission. It's a great commission and it's good news. And we deserve nothing of it and yet it is so wonderfully and freely given. And so we plead, Lord, Restore the backslider, feed the, the saint, and save the sinner, and bring glory to thine own name. Do it, Lord, for thine own glory's sake. In Jesus' name we call upon thee. Amen. Receive the benediction of our God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.